Flying in. This is great. So nice to have you all here. Uh, Greg Young is here. That's good. Uh, the list keeps growing and growing. Hello, Greg. How are you? If you can hear, not if you can hear me. Adam, do you hear me? I hear you. Okay, I'm going to go on mute again. All right. I'll wait until everyone is here. Hello, Greg. <laughs> Hello. So we always give about five minutes for people to uh, jump in. And uh, Greg has a bit of a time crunch, so we may just have him talk first. And then... Uh, and then we'll continue with the questions and answers after he has to go. Greg, you're still, you still got to like jump off an hour from now, right? Uh, roughly an hour. Okay. And right, let me uh, just mute here. Yeah, let me know if you can uh, share some of your old slides and any of that stuff that you want to do. Hold on one second. Yeah, no worries. Hey, Bobby. Bobby's here. That's great. Sorry about that. I'm just turning off all the extraneous noises here. Yeah, no, that's great. I think, uh, well, we're at 25. I think we have 100 and uh, some odd people signed up. So I guess they're just finding their way here. Um, some might have been waiting. I kind of started the the okay, so uh, actual Zoom call right at uh, right at ten thirty. So we're gonna have okay, a no of, problem. What's the so overall what's itinerary? Introduction to CKRS and event sourcing. By this time, Greg, I hope you have this uh, on the back of your hand. <laughs> okay, let me just pull up my slide. You know, one of one of your you know fifty slide fifty slide decks you did on the subject. Um, I'm gonna do some alternate representations of. Um, one of the things that we're, we're going to do with the CKRS and event sourcing explanation is really just suppose next to uh, next to another traditional architecture and traditional information flow with the information flow in a CKRS event source system so that people can see side by side what most systems are doing versus what an event source system does. And so I think doing this across a timeline with an event modeling diagram will spell it out quite quite clearly. So that's my goal for today. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to stick around for that, but um, hopefully, yeah, we can probably blast through your uh, blast through your presentations and, uh, and and get to questions. I'm not going to stop this meeting uh, right at uh, 12:30 um, in case there's questions. I do, however, have to do a podcast interview at some point, which would be, let me just check the time. Yeah, 1 p.m. So uh, 1 p.m. is a podcast interview. So uh, we got two and a half hours. We're going to have just over two hours to do all this. And uh, if we don't get through everything, I'm happy to continue on Friday um, to, to do a follow-up part two, maybe do an advanced one. We can probably park some of the questions that are advanced and, uh, and do that on the Friday so that uh, people that are here to learn uh, about event sourcing and, uh, and CKRS uh, will get the, founda like the foundation, like the core knowledge uh, of, of what that means. And, uh, and then we can dive into some, uh, some of the edge cases and advanced topics uh, on Friday. Um, I haven't made that announcement yet, but I think just given the schedules, and uh, how many people are here? Probably gonna get quite a few questions. We're gonna do the, inter maybe we'll just call it intermediate. Um, 
CKRS and event sourcing and, uh, and get through that on the Friday. So uh, yeah, hopefully that'll be, that'll be okay for most people. Um, I'm recording these, so I'll be publishing them as soon as possible uh, on the YouTube channel, um, which, uh, which I will publish, I guess, uh, the link to just on Twitter and things like that. Usually we can get the announcements on Twitter. Um, so yeah. Man, Let's I see. must have a thousand different copies of these slides. I know, I've, I have the same problem with event modeling now. There's about like 50 different ones and uh, I've well, just and started. I've got, them, I've got them online at least like 50 different places. So it's like when I bring them up, I have to look through and it's like, okay, what might be added or removed from this version? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, that's the same kind of, that's why I kind of go back to uh, the one article I wrote on event modeling. If I'm talking about event modeling, it's like a stand in for it's a stand in for slides. I'll just, you know, scroll between the different paragraphs and just talk about them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, I guess. What's funny I is I, I also use those same slides. <coughs> for, for what? For when I teach a class, I use the exact same slides for that yeah. one part of it. Let's see, there's a lot of people joining still. So We'll give it five more minutes and then uh, and then yeah, we'll, no we'll get going. By the way, did you see I had uh, online that I, I picked up a noodle screen? What, the, the fly fishing rods? Is no, no, no. Uh, I, I picked up a second monitor for 100 bucks. Oh, yeah, no, I saw that. That's pretty cool <clears throat> for travel, for sure. It's awesome. Well, yeah, and it, it actually charges off the laptop. Yeah. I... Uh, I have a, a screen and a tablet combination, see? So you can just draw on it, well, which is given awesome. The price of it, I picked it up for all of a hundred bucks. I'm oh yeah, no, that's awesome. Going, I'm thinking about going and buying one or two more of them. Yeah. Because who doesn't want to be able to force me? I don't know, I, some people are, I mean, I kind of alt tab my way. There's a few people that kind of are don't want two screens for whatever reason. They're just uh, they're just they have their virtual desktop set up and uh, and it seems to be uh, seems to be all good. Uh, let's see. T minus two minutes, Greg. Let me know when you're ready. Okay. Just give me one second here. T minus two minutes. I just have to switch a second screen. So it's put properly. And... Uh, I made some co hosts. Uh, so if there's some trouble, people, you know, Zoom bombing or whatever, the people that I put as co hosts, please kick those people out uh, ASAP. And uh, I will try to do my best to edit out uh, any shenanigans. Let me just uh, try sharing here. Host disabled participant screen sharing. I'm gonna just add you as a co-host. Hold on, I haven't done oh, okay. that yet. Yeah. I just wanted to verify that it actually works and you see the yeah, right thing yeah. on the screen. Yeah, it's all good. You should be good now. Just making sure we have enough people um, helping. Yep. You're sharing a blank screen. Oh, no, there it is. Unleash your domain. Yeah. So if I come in here. What the hell? Oh, I just got it going through. Why is it not coming up? Oh, there we go. That looks a little bit better. 
Oh, Bobby's here. I'm going to make Bobby a co-host as well. I forgot. Do you see it now? Unleash your domain by Greg Young. And uh, it looks like this person is doing... This presentation 800 times. This person doesn't care for their work. They're throwing away all their work into the wind. <laughs> I don't know what you're trying to convey here, but that's what I see. Unleashing your domain is really quite wasteful and bad for the environment. Shouldn't that go in the recycling box? <clears throat> And, oh, Matt's here too. That's great. So let's let's make Matt a co-host as well. Um, he Matt can help uh, keep the riffraff out if someone. There we go. Do, do, do. Okay. Thank you, Matt, for showing up. And uh, who else do we got? And I'll be back in about 60 seconds. Okay, Greg, we'll wait. Okay, Adam, I'm back. So let me just look one more quick thing to do and we should be good to go. Yeah, go for it. Um, whenever you're ready, there's still people pouring in. So I'm just moving over power. Yeah, no worries. That, that would be extraordinarily sad. Right, he got the power off in the middle. And please make sure you're muted throughout this whole thing. Um, I guess I should have. Adam, I assume you want to do an intro or? Yeah, I can introduce you if you like. Let me know when you're ready. And oh, can, I'm, uh... I'm good pretty much whenever it's, uh, are people here and? I think most people are here. It's uh, 43 participants, 107 signed up, so that's their loss. Um, there is a Slack channel. Um, I guess the organizers can post the link to the Zoom in case someone shows up there. Uh, and uh, that's just kind of the housekeeping for this thing. So if we're, uh, if someone is, is uh, <clears throat> missing that you expected here, uh, you can coordinate on the 
event modeling uh, Slack to, uh, to get the link for the Zoom. And then uh, hopefully we'll see the waiting room and get you, uh, uh, get you in. So uh, anyway, all right. Well, thanks, Greg, for making the time. I know that you're, um, I know that you're waiting to get some nice uh, fly rods. Uh, so uh, hopefully we can get through this really quickly. But uh, intro uh, the man that doesn't need much introduction, if you're familiar with uh, CQRS and event sourcing, Greg Young came up with the concept as we know it. I mean, he'll argue that these things have been around forever, as will I. But in terms of a usable uh, way to write software uh, with event sourcing, uh, he's the pioneer. Uh, I was lucky enough to work with Greg uh, in the same city back in 2008, where he set me straight in terms of how to write software. So uh, I'm really thankful uh, to him for that. His experience spans writing dispatch systems for police uh, police dispatch systems and things like that, where you needed you know reliable, auditable systems, um, gambling, trading, fintech, you name it, Greg, Greg's done it. Um, he understands uh, information systems from the level of uh, talking to a CEO and, and a business level all the way down to the actual chips and how they, how they work. And I remember reverse engineering some code with him back in 2008 um, where, yeah, it was highly technical. And so it's rare to meet someone that has uh, a full range and spectrum of uh, anything to do with uh, information system automation programming um, scaling distributed systems so it's always good to have uh, Greg and uh, we're going to have the privilege of asking the expert uh, beginner questions uh, again for those joining late uh, if if needed we're going to have a second uh, a second round of this with uh, more in-depth topics and more advanced topics or intermediate topics this Friday, same time. So hopefully you'll join us, but uh, Greg, nice to have you uh, go ahead and uh, do your thing and we'll have uh, questions after. Um, I'll do a little bit of uh, my representation of it too, if, if uh, we have time. All right, okay, Greg. Sounds good. I'm gonna try to go a little bit faster slides because I've done this presentation so many times and that should give a little bit more time for questions at the end. Um, for people who are watching this, these slides originally came out 12 to 14 years ago. I know that sounds kind of funny when you're hearing that these slides are 12 years old. I'm not shitting you. They are actually like 12 years old. I no gave, doubt. I gave this presentation for the first time in 2008 down by Seattle coming from Vancouver, if I remember correctly. The ideas we're gonna be going through of CQRS and much more importantly, event sourcing are not new. They have at this point been tried in thousands of places. We have a relatively good idea today what pros and cons are and what things that you should be watching out for. Um, I'm not gonna spend a huge amount of time talking about that, although we will spend a bit on it. So, moving forward. Oh, I have to click on my slides in order to be able to use my keyboard. Main things we're gonna be talking about is the issues that we faced, and then we're gonna talk about the varying breakthroughs that we have had and how they really helped out these types of systems. In particular, we're gonna talk about event sourcing, although as these slides are very old, you'll notice that they are called event storage. We're also gonna talk about CQRS, although back then it was called command and query separation. You may know that there is another thing called command and query separation, which is why we ended up needing to make it CQRS as opposed to CQS. And the question has always been, did you really mean cars? It took years and years and years for Google to stop saying, did you mean cars? Today, if you try it, it will say CQRS is actually CQRS. So, when you are building something like a trading system, you are doing thousands of trades per day. One of your main things that you need is a safety net. How many of you would be willing to put millions and millions of dollars on the line throughout the day 
without having a safety net underneath you. This might cause slight issues occasionally. So one of the main problems that we are running into is how do we actually get this safety net underneath things like trading systems? It's another thing that we needed. We needed to be able to look at things scientifically. We need to be able to look and say deterministically, this is what has occurred. And we're not necessarily sure what things we might actually be interested in throughout this. So we need to be able to come back and look at something and say, this is it precisely what the situation was. This is what the decision that was made was. This is why that decision occurred. And I wish we had some hands here, but how many of you have run into a problem in the system before and you have no idea how the hell you got where you are? That's weird that doesn't have the hands. Usually there is a, a chat thing with a hand raising, but... Yeah, uh, but it's not the same as in person where you see the no, hands. No, I know, yeah. <laughs> we can just assume a few. And the thing is, when you're building a system for managing apartment rentals of a building in downtown Vancouver, that's not that big of an issue. When you are doing trading, this is a very, very big issue. Why? Because you have a bunch of trades that are occurring because of a strategy. The trades occurred and then the trades caused something else to occur, which causes something else to occur, which causes something else to occur. Eventually, you're six levels deep into this and you're wondering, how did I get here? This is a big problem with a lot of systems. And the last thing that we really, really needed was auditing. And not all systems need high levels of auditing. Some systems need ridiculous levels of auditing. Trading, we need ridiculous levels of auditing. We need to be able to fill out this is exactly how we got here. And we cannot have mistakes in this. If we have mistakes in this, we're screwed. It's as simple as that. So, most people who are building logs today, and I'm sure if we could do a raise of hands, most of you guys have logs of what's occurring in your system, but you can't prove that they are correct. If you cannot prove that your log is correct, you're screwed. Because you don't know if your log actually matches up to what your system actually is. Where it is today, whether the log matches that, is quite literally sticking your thumb up your ass and saying it's going to rain next Thursday. There were some other people that had a logging problem. You might have heard of Hansel and Gretel. They were going off and they went in the forest and they were going to leave little breadcrumbs as they were heading off to the forest so they'd know how to get their way back out. And then they found this wonderful house and we all know the story and how it goes from there. But what if the birds had never eaten their breadcrumbs? They would have been able to get out, wouldn't they? Their entire problem was in fact an auditing log problem. And it's highly similar to many of the auditing log problems that you will run into in production. This entire concept of having an auditing log, which is verifiable, was the major breakthrough that led to the concept of event sourcing. And I shouldn't say that it led to the concept of event sourcing. Event sourcing was used in many, many places before. It just wasn't really used often throughout many different types of systems. If you go and look back at many old transactional systems, event sourcing was the way to go. They just didn't call it event sourcing. They called it a transaction log. They implemented their own transaction log. Then they did shared memory off of the transaction log and basically would follow through. Now, where this brings us to in our domain, I wish you could show of hands how many have read DDD. 
inside of DDB, they talk about how important it is to model things inside of your domain. But what was never mentioned in domain-driven design was that, well, how you change state is actually a really, really important part of that domain model. It's not that I updated the volume of the order from 200 shares to 100 shares. It's that a trade occurred. This is a material part of my domain. Attempting to model my domain without talking about what things occur in my domain is not highly probable to be a reasonable domain model. <clears throat> These transitions which are occurring, these behaviors which have occurred, are part of my ubiquitous language. They will make my ubiquitous language better. It's more precise to talk about these things than to talk about the volume of this order changed from 200 to 100 shares. How many of you have domain experts that have gotten confused over? some change that has occurred in the domain because there might be multiple reasons for the change. And they were not able to understand which one of these things caused it. They can see that the data changed from X to Y, but they don't understand why it changed from X to Y. This at its core is what an event provides you. It's bringing the change from X to Y and giving it a name. You can now discuss what that change actually was, and there may be 37 ways of changing from X to Y. The event is telling you which one of those 37 things it actually was to change from X to Y. And there are loads and loads of examples that you will see of this. I normally like using orders in the stock market because there's a whole bunch of them. Why can my volume change? Well, you could have changed how much you were looking for. It could be some automated thing back in the computer system based on your inventory. So your inventory was being used up. So it removed volume because you no longer actually had capital to back up that order. It could be another form of automated things that are occurring. It could be trades that are occurring. All these different things can cause a volume to change on an order in the stock market. Why that volume change is more important than what the fucking volume change was in most circumstances. Now, let's go through and take a look at how event sourcing would actually work. And by the way, I have literally been using this picture for 15 years. Well, look at the laptop. Exactly. And we're going to understand in a little while why this picture was so perfect when I actually picked it out. What we have here is a purchase order with N line items and some shipping information. This should look to you like a very typical aggregate inside of a domain model. This is one way of representing a purchase order. But there's other ways of representing a purchase order. I could represent a purchase order as a series of events. And wow, it looks like my slides didn't cut off. That's really cool. So what we have here is actually five events. Uh, they, they got really small when I started putting them as all five. So we have a cart created, three items added, and then shipping information added. Now. What's funny about this is as this slide changes size, that will actually change into shipping informati on edit. The, the on will actually come down here with the added. And it looks like it's possibly being Greek or maybe Italian. But I can represent this concept of a purchase order as these five events. The thing is, there's benefits to me treating it as those five events as opposed to this purchase order. Now, I can always get my purchase order by replaying the five events, and it will give me back in memory or possibly even on persistent storage 
this structure of a purchase order. But I can have an infinite number of possible structures that come off of this series of events. This is one that just might be useful to me right now. Could I have another one that counts how many items were removed from a cart or added to a cart? Could I have another one which counts how many carts were created by Adam? I mean, don't get me wrong, we can do some of these kinds of things inside of our structural model. But once we start saying that our structural model is derived off of this series of events, I can have an infinite number of structural models. I can represent my structural models in ways that make sense for my actual problem. It's not how do I take my structural model and jam it into my problem? It's what structural model would be best for my problem. Does it look like the one that I already have or do I wanna make a new one? It's totally okay to make a new one. I can have 5,000 different structural models of what a shopping cart looks like. That's cool. Now, let's come back to this slide really quick. So you mentioned I've been using this image for a long, 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 long time. And the reason I use this image is because it's hilarious. That is quite literally an accountant erasing something in the middle of their journal. Accountants who do this go to jail. You do not do this in accounting. And you do not do this in event sourcing. Ever. You do not go back and remove something that's already occurred. That thing has occurred. It completed. It completed in the past. Unless you have a fucking time machine, you do not go back and undo it. Don't get me wrong, you can have a new fact that undoes your old fact, but you can't get rid of the fact that already occurred. And we can see this if people happen to have worked with finance before. When you put in a bad transaction on your bank account, we don't just go back and remove that transaction. Why? What happens if you put in a deposit yesterday, which we cleared for $500, because they like to do that one from the ATMs, especially in Canada. Is it $500 now or is it 200? Adam, which is it, 500 or 200? I don't know. <laughs> oh, come on. I'm sure we've all been young enough where we actually did that deposit to get, but it was, uh, it was just a piece of paper in order to yeah, get that was... 200 bucks to come available. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think my brother got caught doing the, you know, some stuff like that. <laughs> we won't talk about it in this particular presentation, but there's actually a whole strategy for that, which is called flying a kite where basically you always have one check that has not been actually processed yet. So basically you keep that, uh, the available balance they make from the check and you float it from check to check to check, writing the checks to yourself. But accountants do not go back and erase things in their ledgers. And we do not do that inside of event sourcing either. Instead what we do, is we always add a new transaction. Always. Anything you do in event sourcing is adding a new transaction. There is no other alternative. You do not go back and remove transactions. Ever. Now I know in the versioning book I talk about, well, we've got these things that are five years old and we don't really care about them anymore. Can we remove it as we move from one version to another version? Yes, 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 you can. Conceptually, they are there forever. And now you'll notice here we have cart created, three items added, one item removed, and then shipping information added. Is this the same as cart created, two items added, shipping information added? And I love doing this in person because you get about half the room going, yes, 
And about half the room going, no. And the big question is, from what perspective? If all I want to know is what's in the cart and I need to shift, then these are identical. What if I was wondering if there's certain items that people remove right before they check out, would they be identical? Why would they be removing an item from their cart right before they check out? I'm guessing price had something to do with that. They're gonna check out, they realize it's $175. They're like, shit, I can't spend $175. The wife's gonna kill me. So I need to remove something. So they deprioritize that item as opposed to the other items. That's a different way of perceiving that series of events, isn't it? What is an item that we should likely advertise to that person in the future? Some random item or some item similar to the item that they removed right before they checked out? What if they removed that item two days before they checked out? Is that the same as if they removed it 10 minutes before they checked out? Very quickly, you start seeing that what we're looking at here are patterns inside of these events. It's not just that we have our events, it's the patterns associated. And this brings us to a happy place. This brings us to a place where we can essentially have a TiVo of our entire system. You can go back and view anything in the history of your system as it was viewed at that point in time 